Okay, well, on that note, we will start. First things first, just a little bit um, of, of housekeeping. So today's session is recorded and it's actually recorded for the benefits um, of, of the community, i.e. it will be then recorded and then shared on our website for anybody that wants to access it in the future, whether that's for your own reference or for internal training purposes. Um, please feel free to use the chat room as much as possible. This is a totally interactive session. Um, you make of this what you want. Um, we want you to ask as many questions. We have some amazing um, speakers today. We're really, really honored to have uh, both Arun and Luca join us. So take this opportunity to ask the questions that, have, that you have been pondering that have been on your mind. Um, so on, on that note, as already mentioned, for some of you that were on time, um, Today's session is going to be uh, brought to you from Raw Compliance on AI and transaction monitoring. Whilst we all know that AI machine learning are the future, the truth is, are, are we really ready? Um, what is it that is our problem statement? What is it that we need to do before we can future-proof ourselves? And is this a situation that we need to take one step back before we can take two steps forward? I'm sure today there will be some analogies um, and references to things like Robocop and Futuristic. Uh, for anybody that's too young to know what that is, Google it. <laughs> but the rest of us will, will, get, the, will get the joke. Um, so on that note, and can I just ask for everybody that's not speaking to make sure that you remain on mute. We haven't muted everybody deliberately because this is an interactive session. But if you're not on mute, everybody else can hear you. Um, so if I will, I will put you on mute if you're not on mute, and I hope that's okay. So on that note, uh, let me kindly introduce today's panelists. Um, both today's panelists are recognized experts in the industry. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we have Luca Primeriano, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who's the Chief um, Artificial Intelligence Officer at Napier AI. Um, Luca is, I, I actually met Luca for the first time when he was actually a guest speaker for the US Department of Justice at their FinTech Public Private Partnership. He is one of the most knowledgeable people in the industry globally in this area. So Luca, if you don't mind, may I ask you just to quickly introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Anna, for the kind word. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Luca Primerano. I'm the head of AI at Napier. Um, the, the, um, the areas I focus on uh, at Napier is all of the artificial intelligence program analysis and work we do with our customers to help them manage their transaction monitoring, transaction screening, and client screening uh, processes. We believe that artificial intelligence uh, has to be part of all of the solutions that are used in, in this space and help our clients moving forwards in a journey of uh, um, you know, moving, moving from traditional rule-based system towards uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Today, I, hopefully, I will uh, tell you a little bit more about, um, um, you know, our work, the key challenges we've seen in the industry, and, uh, and how we can work together to, to improve them and, uh, and use artificial intelligence in, in, in doing so. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Luca. Um, and, and secondly, and I should say last but not least, also Arun Boynia is joining us. Um, Arun is a seasoned industry expert in transaction monitoring. In fact, I had the pleasure previously of working with Arun, um, and so I can personally testify for his expertise in this area. So Arun, thank you so much for joining us. And would you like to say any words before we start? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks, uh, first of all, Unaik, for inviting me to this uh, session. Uh, yeah, as a very quick introduction, I've been, uh, I've worked with HSBC for the last 21 years. And before you get jealous of me, uh, I've just uh, taken a break from work to spend some quality family time uh, uh, with, with, with my family. They have been complaining uh, me of not giving them time uh, over these years. Uh, so, which is why you don't see a, a remark of HSBC in my designation. Uh, uh, I, uh, I had the opportunity uh, of being associated with HSBC uh, for the last uh, 12 years, specifically in the compliance field, where uh, we were under the radar of the U.S. prosecutors and regulators, and uh, the, uh, thanks to the deferred prosecution agreement that we were under. And therefore, uh, you know, we, we had to go through a, a, a Herculean change in the financial uh, crime risk framework. Uh, and, and 
i'll be able to share some experiences of how uh, our uh, world around transaction monitoring etc had also evolved and we have you know partnered well with the regulators and the right uh, so enough of me talking here but i you know <laughs> I'll do more when the slides come up. Yeah. No, honestly, Erin, thank you very, very much. So we just actually launched a poll, um, which I suppose speaks for itself, on whether you think the adoption of AI and machine learning will solve all of our monitoring problems. Um, so the answers, as you can see, yes, no, or other. If you actually think other, could you please type in the chat room, um, you know, some of your thoughts around that? And again, we can kind of kick off the interactive discussion. So in today's session, um, in terms of the slides, this is the format of the slides, but if the questions in the chat room take us another direction, that's fantastic as well. So we will be talking about what is artificial intelligence? Uh, what is the regulatory appetite and support uh, for building AI and machine learning infrastructure? What is the problem? And in fact, do you understand yours? And that's actually a really important question because a lot of us are talking and about AI and machine learning. And when we have these kind of, you know, hot topics, we, we all kind of jump into the discussions around them. But the truth is, do we really understand our specific internal challenges and, and problem statement? And how are we going to actually bring these futuristic solutions into our, let's say, in some instances, and I hate to say prehistoric technology frameworks. We're also going to be talking about what are the challenges of integrating AI and machine learning to these existing technology frameworks. Is it possible? Um, in some instances, actually, it may not be. And then last but not least, how can we solve the problems? Um, so interestingly, in the poll, uh, do you think that AI machine learning will solve all of our problems? 52% uh, no, said no. Uh, and the 22% that said other happen. Oh, here we go. Uh, from Julia, other, it will not solve all. Um, it depends on what data we have to feed into the machines. Absolutely. Um, we also need sustainable operating model to support. And I think that's going to be one of our key discussion points from today's session is we need sustainability in our systems. We need systems that will develop and grow as we develop and grow. Naturally, AI and machine learning will do that. But unfortunately, the technology we have today is incredibly fragmented. Um, so again, we will be talking about all of those issues today. Um, and also, yeah, human intelligence and case by case basis. Yeah, it's a really good point from, from Benny. We need people to actually help to educate and to teach the systems. And if we're actually getting it wrong today ourselves, how do we expect an artificial intelligence being taught by us to get it right? Um, so on that note, I'm actually going to pass it over, if I may, to, to Luca to talk through kind of our first few slides. Um, Luca, I can control the slides, so just tell me when you want me to change the slides and I, will, I can move them along. Absolutely, um, thank you. So, uh, first of all, we prepared a few slides, but if you guys have any questions, please type them in the charts. This is just kind of a, 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 kind of a tool to, to help us in this discussion, but the more interactive we can make this, the better, the better it is. So first of all, let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about artificial intelligence because uh, it's kind of a buzzword. Everybody talks about it, but what is it? And, and uh, my, in my opinion, I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of uh, uh, data points in history, but in my opinion, there are multiple ways to, to read artificial intelligence and the application of artificial intelligence nowadays. So uh, I'm a chess player, so I always start talking uh, about uh, artificial intelligence using the chess metaphor and the chess example. And uh, if you think about uh, going back in time in 1997, IBM developed this machine that was able to challenge the world, world chess champion, Gary Kasparov, back, back then. And this machine was really, really complicated. It was a state of the art. And it was able to defeat the world chess champion. And, and uh, people didn't believe this would have ever happened because with chess, you need a lot of creativity. You need problem solving. You need imagination, which is something which was difficult to synthesize back then. And when IBM created this machine, and this machine was able to defeat the world chess champion, then all of a sudden, the perspective and the understanding of AI changed. The machine was really good. It was. Uh, calculating more than 50 million moves a second. Gary Kasparov could analyze two or three moves per second, but uh, it was a state of the art in 1997. And this machine that back then was considered artificial intelligence had a set of predefined rules that was able to help them solve the problems and the situation and finally defeat the world champion. So 
if, so if I look at it from today's standards, I wouldn't necessarily call this artificial intelligence, but back then it was considered, because it was considered so. Yeah. So if we move on to the next slide, and if we fast forward 20 years from that event, in 2018, uh, AlphaGo, which is a, a, a kind of a machine learning program uh, developed by uh, the, the, uh, some scientists that, with a company that got acquired by Google, developed this uh, an, a really complex set of algorithms that was able to learn from itself how to play chess, Go, and all of these games. And within one day of playing against itself, was able to get to a level where it could defeat the World Go, uh, the world ch uh, go champion. And uh, the complexity of the problem was uh, hundreds of trillions of times more difficult than chess. However, the machine was able to defeat, um, to defeat the world chess champion. So as you can see, um, the, there has been a change in the evolution of artificial intelligence system. And this system, which, which, developed, uh, which was developed using um, neural network and, and deep learning, is something that we would call today artificial intelligence. It's a set of systems and algorithms that are capable of solving very simple problems in uh, uh, very quickly better than human beings. So this is what we tend to call artificial intelligence, the ability to learn uh, and, and make decisions. But going forward, what will artificial intelligence be um, in, in the future? And uh, if we move on to the next slide, which, which like uh, uh, talks about, you know, uh, Terminator, right? A machine that is capable of making decision on every sort of type of questions and is capable of learning new things as we go along. Is this going to be the future? Is it something that uh, it, it will never happen? We, 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 we don't know. We know we have uh, um, artificial intelligence in automated car. We've got artificial intelligence almost everywhere. But where do we move from the ability to solve a very simple problem, very well defined, through to creating and, and deciding on, on a range of different uh, on a range of different areas. So if we move on to the next slide, the, why all of this introduction? The introduction is to say that the, the perception of what AI is has changed through time. And uh, um, we are at a point where AI, in my opinion, encompass, encompass several disciplines, such as you know, traditional heuristics, rule-based systems. Um, then you've got uh, machine learning, which we'll see uh, has got lots of application in transaction monitoring. Then we need to look at computer vision, interaction between systems. And in this ecosystem, all of these tools talk to each other and together they are helping us solve very difficult problems when it comes to transaction monitoring. For example, around pattern identification, pattern prediction, and understanding of anomalies within data and within client activities. So think about it as an ecosystem where you've got all of these different components that are playing together to help us solve very specific problems that may take a human being a lot of time to solve. Going through billions of transactions, uh, it, it, takes, it takes a long time, whilst the machine can learn and specifically identify pattern in, in that data. Yeah. And, and look, you know, one of the points that's been said here in the chat room by Sintuja is quality of data um, is paramount here. You know, they do play a key role in the success of any transaction monitoring program, but an AI is all well and good, but garbage in, garbage out is what you will get. Um, and so a lot of the challenges we're seeing in the industry is specifically around this data point. And obviously when you're speaking with you, with your clients as well, you know, the data fragmentation that currently exists in uh, financial institutions is an astronomical problem. So, you know, at this moment in time, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail later in the slides, but uh, just specifically to do with data, have there been any kind of simple or quick fixes um, or anything from a simplistic perspective that banks have been able to do to fix some of their data problems today? These are really good questions. And uh, we see a kind of a broad range of uh, maturity within our clients. You have the clients that has already solved all of the problems related to data, but then you have clients that are at the beginning of the journey. And uh, it is really true that the quality of the output of machine learning heavily depends on the quality of the input. And I'll give you an example, a kind of an anecdote. When um, we did one of our first implementation of machine learning a few years back, 
we were working with a client and then we set up all of this uh, incredible technology and the technology was going through millions of transactions in a few seconds and he spotted an anomaly on a set of customers, on a set of accounts, and then we were all very interested in understanding what the problem was and what the machine identified. And we realized that the anomaly was due to a, an interface that whereby the clients um, had a, a data quality issue and therefore some currency wasn't converted properly and the machine spotted it. So the, the story here is that, um, yeah, absolutely, the quality of data is really important. The machine can spot the anomalies, but we need to use the machine to solve the right problems. And if we are not able to get the, the data up to a specific quality, then we're going to have problems. Yeah. For us, this is a journey where we start working with clients, helping understand their data, transform their data in such a way that the data can be standardized and, and put it into a format where it's very easy for the machine to learn very quickly. Now, this is an iterative approach. And, and in my opinion, there isn't a silver, silver bullet where you can consolidate all of the data together. We've yeah. seen a lot especially in the last five years uh, of projects and work that clients are undertaking in, in order to merge all of the information together and, and increase their quality of the data. But it's, it's gonna take time. And, and also if you consider that the amount of data generated on a yearly basis uh, is increasing exponentially, then this requires disciplines to make sure that the right information is fed to the machine and the machine can maximize the outcome it generates from analyzing it. Yeah, and uh, Debbie, and one of the things that I've seen in over the past few years, in particular with regards to investigations, is with data. You know, when we've been doing investigations, we've also identified that there are multiple sources of truth, which the organisations themselves didn't even realise existed within their network. Um, and when we try to bring that information together with the best intentions in the world, it becomes corrupted um, because obviously different people are trying to put different things into standardized you know, templates and boxes. And we've also concerningly seen a lot of spreadsheet risks still existing with institutions where they haven't even moved from spreadsheets into systems, which is actually quite a good thing, you know, when we want to go to, to more sophisticated automation because it's not been automated yet, but it still is worrying that in the year 2020, we're still sitting in, the, in that environment. So on that note, we're getting lots of questions into the chat room, but if you don't mind, I'll just quickly go to the next slide and, and, and again, over then to Arun, um, talking about the regulatory appetite and support for innovation and, and innovation of activities. Um, and again, Arun, you've been involved in a lot of work, you know, in recently your time at HSBC, for example, you've been involved in the US deferred prosecution, you've been also looking at ways in which to make the banking system much more innovative and structured and make it future proofed. And uh, HSBC is known across the banking industry as being one of the more futuristic um, in, in playing with technology, in particular for financial crime purposes. So possibly can I pass it over to you to talk a little bit about the regulators and innovation? Yeah, thanks, Anna. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, you know, the, uh, an encouraging thing that we have noticed from the regulators and particularly of the regulators in more of the developed countries, uh, to, be, to be very frank over here, who have uh, seen uh, and expressed an interest in understanding how you know, that the world of AML and transaction monitoring could be evolved further through the use of, uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence. Now, you know, I'll possibly talk about a, a, a point which, uh, which many of us would have faced in their day-to-day -day life right now. It, it, is a, it is a very known practice that uh, banks and financial institutions will take approximately 60 to 90 days for an alert investigation. That is the time after the alert generation uh, for, and, and, and then file a SAR where it is uh, relevant. So effectively, if you see, the regulators get a site of the SAR almost after 120 days after an, uh, an, a transaction had actually passed through a customer's account, which from their perspective and from the perspective of the law enforcement agencies is, is too late. And what we have seen is regulators coming back to the banks and financial institutions saying that, oh, well, this is, is not an acceptable position. You need to reduce the turnaround time by which, you, by which time you can uh, uh, file the uh, star with us. And, and who helps us there? And we, we have to look at the capabilities of the AI and machine learning over here uh, to help that. Uh, you know, with 
uh, not not uh, one of the things that we have recently experimented is something called as an intelligence led financial crime risk management which is more around uh, a dynamic uh, segmentation of the customers uh, when when we talk about transaction monitoring what what it means is that instead of uh, we waiting for the customers uh, profile to be updated once you know uh, during the the periodic life cycle which is one year or three years or five years etc we are doing it dynamically and then the transactions are then getting monitored as per the updated risk profile of the customers now this is where uh, you know uh, julia raised a point about you know what about the data and yes agree if we look at the primitive way of how we were doing the transaction monitoring the data that we were using was only uh, you know whatever was the data that was available in the systems which which may not have been as intelligent as possible but when we talk about ai that is where um, some you know the, the the kind of data that the system uses is much more advanced than that yeah. uh, for example something like a you know I, i would have covered that in a subsequent slide but something like a natural language processing now natural language processing uh, uh, it, it's a concept which is slowly coming up uh, but it's basically nlp is a sub field of linguistics computer science and ai which is basically concerned with the interactions between computers and human language right now where uh, in particular how the how to program computers to process and analyze large amounts of natural language data now what what i mean over here is that yes it it is you know we could argue that it is a garbage in garbage out but look at how ai is trying to use the data which had not been capitalized in the past and then using it to improve the transaction monitoring capabilities regulators are not an experts by themselves right they are also looking for suggestions from us so it is then more uh, uh, you know relevant for us to keep on uh, having regular interaction with them and come with them uh, come to them and uh, explain them how how this particular innovation is going to be helpful and that is how you know uh, given the examples of five key authorities who have definitely expressed an interest Yeah. in some of the developing countries however you may possibly see that uh, the regulator would say oh come on first of all you you know you get your transact existing transaction monitoring right and then we will talk about innovation so you know th- there is there is a mixed bag uh, which and that balance has to be handled well and it is uh, it, you know the more that we start performing without losing the risk over there is which the regulators will start appreciating And there's a good question um Arun thank you very much for that comprehensive uh from a um Anant um the use of AI uh, machine learning and compliance is it a regulatory mandate I think that the quick answer is no um I think no regulator is expecting us to implement AI and machine learning they're expecting us to have some type of technology solutions in place because the amount of data as you rightly said to try and identify a uh, transaction monitoring you know, basically financial crime on our own is impossible because of the amount of data um but there's some other questions here have also come through um with regards to uh, a question from from Lindner said obviously regulators there is a differentiation between regulators and and how hesitant they are so for example he's saying here germany switzerland and austria are quite hesitant regarding reg innovation but yet then we see for example the mas in singapore who are fully backing this and in fact have an entire innovation department built to support it yep. so from it, from coming from a global bank how have you managed that across varying regulators with varying expectations or indeed appetites for this evolution i think one of the very simple and quick answer is we have not switched off the existing route based system okay so it it, it it's uh, it it is a particular time when we will have to invest uh, uh, in parallel on both platforms which is uh, the existing rule based systems and the ai based systems and in uh, we need to have a continuous interaction with the regulators to show that the ai based systems are Uh, possibly giving me the same or if not better output through the use uh, uh, you know of the innovative tools which i i would have anyway achieved through uh, the uh, traditional transaction man- uh, monitoring systems so if 
you know, it, it, it's also a, a numbers which will help the regulators to understand. If 1,000 alerts resulted in 10 SARS and an AI tool would have given you only some 100 events out of which you file the same 10 SARS, wouldn't the regulator really appreciate that you know, instead of you know, investing our efforts into 1,000 alerts, we just look at 100 events which are coming in from the AI. And, and still the, the risk is addressed because from, from their perspective, what they want is if there is a guy who is suspicious, if there is an entity which is uh, suspicious, we have to file a SAR. They, they, uh, uh, having an AI or not having an AI is not going to uh, put us into any kind of regulatory embargo uh, over there. But it is more about uh, having a, a, a time when we invest parallelly in both the systems and then uh, explain to the regulator that which are the which is the one that we want to switch from. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And and look, obviously, in your experience, um, you know, you again, you've been working with a global footprint in this area. Have you faced any challenges or obstacles from a regulatory perspective in in driving out more futuristic solutions through Napier? <laughs> So uh, it is a good question and uh, maybe three, four years ago, there was the tendency of considering the application of AI as a binary, either we, we do AI or we don't, either we use AI to auto discount alerts or we don't. I think we are now at a point where there are multiple applications of AI. For example, AI can provide better explanation uh, related to the customer, it can describe independently their activities. So what we've seen so far is that this multiple application of artificial intelligence can really speed things up for users without potentially, without increasing the risk. With, for, for example, if you apply a solution that automatically close down alerts or automatically discount uh, data. So for us, it's about applying artificial intelligence into explaining customer behavior and profile, into e integrating multiple activities, also using natural language processing, we can combine transaction monitoring and screening all in the same view of the customer. Yeah. So it's not just about, you know, uh, removing traditional rule-based system, but it's augmenting them with additional information. And this is why we can mitigate some of the risks that some of the regulators uh, are raising. Yeah. Obviously, it's a journey, so maybe in three, four years' time, the regulator will want uh, to replace all of the rule-based system with machine learning, but we're not quite there yet, and we need to slowly you know, add machine learning and AI use cases without increasing the risk of the system. And I think there's a really good word that you used there was traditional ways of thinking. And, you know, if we want to be innovative, we need to change the way in which we think about the problem and also the solution by looking at different and, and new and innovative ways to tackle it. And, and quite interestingly, in the poll that we've just um, launched on the challenges in adoption of AI machine learning, 68% of people on today's call have said inexperience and lack of skill sets is actually the reason why we're not being able to, to take those steps ahead. And, um, you know, are you seeing, you know, again, using the word traditional, how are we going to evolve from a traditional mindset um, to a futuristic one, especially in a, in a good comparison? And again, I don't say this for all, but if we look at digital banking today, on the front end, it looks great. It's innovative. It's new. But on the back end, there's no difference to traditional banking. It's all the same manual processes that we're using. And there isn't this, can I say, sexy technology. So, you know, how are we getting people, both skill sets and mindset, mind, mindset shift from traditional to innovative to futuristic AI? So, I mean, in my personal opinion, um, it's about the ability to solve problems and it's about the ability to investigate uh, suspicious activities and unusual accounts. I wouldn't necessarily call uh, this is kind of a, a, a the AI way. Yeah. It's just being able to have software that can help the user make the, the best decision in the shortest amount of time. For sure, what we need to do, we need to upskill people, make sure they understand machine learning and artificial intelligence. But what we don't want to create is a complex system with a lot of data and a lot of information that will just confuse analysts or, or investigators. We want to help them make the right decision. So for us, if I look at the, the user experience, for me, it's the user experience of the analyst, of the investigator. So for me, success means having a 
software products and technology that help people do their daily jobs as opposed to force people to change their mindsets to basically operate this new technology is the technology that has to be adapted to people in my opinion and not vice versa and this is why i think we can uh, we can solve this this problem uh, there was a question in in the chat which was quite interesting which was asking um, that you know one of the key challenges in anti financial crime is the cost is the compliance cost and uh, if we run rules and artificial intelligence in parallel you are basically theoretically doubling the cost because you've got to parallel process i don't see it that way the way i see it is that you can have your traditional system you can have your traditional maturity within your organization your data but you can use artificial intelligence to for example decrease the time it takes you to review an alert or decrease the time it takes you to investigate the case to have more information the right quality of the information at the right time to make a decision so it's not about running two inefficient processes in parallel it's about running a process driven by machine learning, which can make your life more efficient, your processes more effective, and minimize the risk uh, as an organization. And, and I think there's definitely a whole aspect of here of going back to basics. And I, I do use that a lot because I like, you know, I've always say that compliance isn't rocket science. Um, you know, it is over-engineered in, in some regards within an inch of its life. And as Arun pointed out earlier on, some of our transaction monitoring alerts aren't being picked up or reviewed, you know, post a hundred, you know, up to 120 days after the actual alert occurred. And depending on your regulatory reporting and your regulatory expectations on timelines, that's also a big challenge. So we, we do need these systems that people can focus their attention on the real risks and not the, let's just say at the moment, the amount of garbage that we're getting out of the systems and that we currently are using because of the fact that they're really badly calibrated or indeed just not fit for purpose for many of the products and services that we're offering. Um, so on that note, um, Arun, again, from an AML perspective, there are a number of challenges that we're seeing. And, and maybe you would like to talk us through this. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, Unag, we, we uh, touched on, on a number of these uh, points. So, so what this basically slide uh, tells us is basically uh, what are our opportunities and what are our, our challenges? Uh, you know, the opportunity is that you know the the uh, the, the regulators being being open to the innovation and uh, finding better ways of of managing things. Even uh, the management of the banks and the financial institutions also want to optimize the resources. Uh, you know, COVID of course poses altogether a new challenge. It has given a completely new dimension to uh, the entire financial sector that whatever was the world before 2020 is not the world that is going to be after 2020 right it, it, we, we need to make effective use of the existing resources uh, and and cost is going to be a challenge for most of the organization now uh, cost you know usually starts adding pressure onto the existing processes and the people uh, so if if we don't innovate ourselves we uh, an opportunity could equally become a challenge then yeah. Uh, uh, now, in, in terms of, I'll, I'll, I'll speak more on, on the challenges. Uh, one is, uh, you know, as, as we can see, even from the chat room, uh, uh, people talking about uh, uh, what does AI really achieve, which the transaction monitoring uh, didn't achieve. And that is, that is one of the confusion in, in the set of people. And maybe people just say, oh, uh, uh, an automated transaction monitoring is AI. Uh, so, you know, transaction monitoring is, uh, you know, the legacy is only manual and the moment you have automated, it means AI. Yeah, that, that's not uh, really the case. Uh, so, it, uh, similarly, you know, uh, one of the chats that I just saw uh, also said that uh, if we invest on two parallel things, which is uh, uh, the transaction monitoring and uh, AI, isn't this a duplication of our effort and cost? And again, that, that is a big challenge when uh, we have to invest on two parallel uh, processes around it. Uh, again, uh, the skill set of the resources. Now, this, this skill set is, is something which is, uh, you know, it, 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 it develops over time. It is not something which anybody uh, can be taught in a uh, in an university saying that, okay, this is how you, you develop AI and then, you know, okay, go ahead. The system is uh, up and running. 
and this is where we need a lot of cooperation and uh, hand holding even from the law enforcement agencies to the extent that they can cross share uh, we we file a sar we don't know what happens to that sar after we file it with them okay the more the more that we get the feedback uh, from back from the law enforcement agency saying that okay this sar was successful but this wasn't that helps uh, you know uh, people like luca to again uh look at okay how to you know fine tune our uh, ai technology to ensure that we reduce even uh, whatever crap that we might be filing it with the regulators <laughs> right uh and 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 then uh and, and the, the point which is linked with the skilled resources is uh, basically uh, regulators uh, when you go to them and they ask okay what are you going to achieve out of this out of the automation and and sometimes if we don't have the the correct set of people who who are speaking with them uh, we are not even in a position to uh, explain them well uh, as to what are their point last but not the least is around the data uh, sharing and data security because you know uh, if most of these tools can be best operated only when we uh, invest adequately in the cloud based technology and uh, increasingly uh, the the regulators uh, you know on a non financial crime side but they uh, they are getting wary about uh, uh, sharing of uh, customer data even within the country you know of course there have been concerns uh, outside the country but even within the country who should have the access to the data is is a big question yeah so these are the kind of uh, challenges that i'm i'm conscious of we even when i was working with hsbc sometimes even to get a clearance of our data sharing from the regulators sometimes to more than an year in in uh, some geographies yeah. and and in some cases we never got those approvals so it's it's not that this particular problem is only unique for smaller organizations also it's equally big for bigger ones yeah and i'm glad um arun that you touched on the legacy problem of the sar black box um and the fact that you know sar are submitted and then they disappear into this you know this this abyss we don't really know what happens with them we we're not getting that typology information back and there but to be fair there is also then a lot of banks who've taken it upon themselves should i say individuals within banks to form working groups so we know hong kong we have fimlet the uk gymlet we have all of these working groups within the industry coming together to talk about these challenges and and i have to say credit where credit's due the for example the us department of justice have a fintech public private partnership where they're actually coming to key people in the industry to ask them what are these problems and again as i mentioned that is where i had the honor of meeting luca you know luca was was teaching and educating the doj on the challenges in ai um and the fact that you know ai isn't you know what isn't the systems that we're doing today it, and as you rightly said arun you know making our systems more sophisticated that's not ai ai is you know it's it's a whole different aspect of the system actually basically undertaking a lot of the element of the human processing that we're doing today and then allowing a human to sit and look at the key escalations and not just every single piece that comes out of the system which which is the problem we have today right. so so look i don't know if you've anything further you wanted to add to that before moving on to the kind of the black box yes actually i i'll basically uh, link some of the challenges that are mentioned in the previous slide with a question from anant in in the chat around explainability let's see if i can find the question um how can human uh, review ai solution output effectively and efficiently so one of the key problems when it comes to artificial intelligence is the concept of a black box right you've got this incredible set of algorithms to just give it loads of data and they tell you review discounts high risk low risk but nobody understands what's in the black box and nobody understands how i can relate the output of the decision back with the data that influenced this decision if i look at the last 2 to 3 years there has been an incredible advancement uh, around explanation uh, framework when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning that we use for example and is the ability to link the outputs back to the information the data that is triggered basically the the way forward and how we can explain the decision a machine is making to an analyst i'll give an example there is a framework and there is a, a technology called shapley it uses game theory now without getting into the detail of how this works we have the ability to say 
we get lots of data from customer, from behaviors, from historical transactional data into a set of machine learning models. And the machine learning model says, I believe the risk is high. And the risk is high because I found this specific behavior in this specific period of time with this specific customer. And, and this is the explanation. If we can combine all of this together, good quality artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm, good quality input, and a good explanation, then hopefully we can bridge the gap between, you know, the, the you know, four or five years old uh, view of artificial intelligence as a black box that nobody understands how it works towards something which is a little bit more transparent that tells everybody why the machine has made a decision, what was the evidence for the decision, and why um, then the, the, suggesting a specific, uh, a specific outcome. And I think there was another question, I don't remember who asked that, around how can AI make sure that the evidence in a case is of good quality? Or how can I make sure that the input the machine is taking is of good quality? And there are artificial intelligence applications, you're not gonna believe it, that looks at making sure that the input of another machine learning model is of good quality. So if you think about it, there is a um, multiple application in the value chain that can help us making sure that we can improve the quality and the maturity of the data in an organization. We can improve the output of machine learning and we can explain everything because when the regulator is asking, why did you discount this or why you didn't do a follow up on this specific behavior, then we need to be able to articulate in a level that anybody will understand why the machine has made that suggestion. Yeah. I think it was Moshin that asked that question with regards to supporting evidence. So thank you very much for, for answering that question. And what's been really reassuring to hear as well is, for example, Nabel has been talking about the successful public-private partnerships, the PPP that exists in Australia through Fintel Alliance. And it's really wonderful when we begin to hear these positive stories um, about where these relationships are working because we can't do it on our own. We need the regulators to be part of this. We need the government agencies that have the information to be part of this. We need the likes of, of Interpol, of MI6, the CIA, all of these different agencies need to be involved to help us so we can understand the typologies to better develop our systems. Um, and then obviously then on, to, on that note, talking about the decision dilemma and how these systems are actually going to work. You know, with such mass amount of data going into the system, how is the system actually understanding where to look, how to look, and teaching itself the types of typologies um, that could be evolving with, within our systems and within our clients? Yeah, so the, the other question is, um, this is just an example on this slide of uh, a set of transaction and it's just saying, okay, the machine has identified a set of anomalies and they're in red. The question is why? Why are they anomalies? You know, what, what, sorry, why are they anomalies? Why is a specific dot an anomaly in which context? So the word context becomes more and more important as, you know, data, data in, in isolation doesn't necessarily mean anything unless we put it in a context unless the context is a specific behavior of a specific segment of a specific customer. So the decision dilemma is, how do we make sure that machine learning is fine tuned in such a way that is detecting the anomalies that we want the machine to detect and, and, and letting others uh, that are of less relevance uh, go through. And there are several technologies, several application of AI, such as active learning, which combines unsupervised and unsupervised learning. So it's a combination of multiple lenses that the machine throw at the data that can help us improve, continuously improve the decision the machine is making. So the decision dilemma, once again, is really important to make sure we let the machine remove the noise continuously and focus only on the elements we're interested in without discarding the unknown unknowns, i.e. The, you know, the patterns we've never seen before that we want to keep on seeing. Then I'll talk about the measures of success because uh, so for the last, once again, few years, there has been, uh, you know, two sides of the spectrum. One side of the spectrum, which was saying, okay, machine learning is, you know, it's too difficult, it's, it's, we do not understand. So we've seen that we are trying to make the explanation better, simplify, so that everybody can understand the output and therefore the complexity decreases. On the other side, we're seeing that we want people to learn how machine learning works, give them tools to assess 
and answer the question, is machine learning working for that specific scenario? What are the measures of success? What are the outcomes I want to achieve? Do I want to get faster investigation, better quality, reduce the risk? And therefore, what are the tools that I need as a professional to make sure I can assess the success uh, of machine learning and machine learning application? Yeah. And, and, and this is linked to one question from some Sudwa that was asking, is artificial intelligence costly? Um, you know, how can we apply to small and medium enterprises, for example? And the answer is that artificial intelligence was expensive maybe 10 years ago because the hardware you needed to run all of these complex algorithms was very, very expensive. But in the last year or two years, uh, with the advancement in um, GPUs, which is the graphic cards, which are uh, used to, to run a lot of calculation very, very quickly, and the decreasing cost of cloud computing and, and CPU processing, using artificial intelligence is becoming way, way cheaper. And therefore, there isn't such an entry barrier as it used to be maybe five or 10 years ago, where only the top organization could afford yeah. such a, a costly infrastructure. And I think, um, you know, what we'll, we'll move on in, in one second, obviously, to not just the cost, but the ethical aspects of AI. But what has been quite an interesting discussion lately has been credible deterrent. And our organizations really willing to put their to put, to put the money into this, um, you know, and our fines actually a credible deterrent to the organizations. And what was incredibly interesting and, and frightening, hopefully, for a number of CEOs globally this week was when Ralph Hammers, the, the previous CEO of ING, now CEO of UBS, has actually been personally indicted by the Dutch government for the AML crimes committed by ING. And that's a very, very frightening uh, situation, not just for him to be in, but for other CEOs in the industry. You know, banks such as HSBC, Standard Charter, Deutsche, you know, you name it, banks that have been involved in AML investigations and charged um, as a sub as subsequently in, in respective areas, their CEOs are now going to be held potentially personally liable by, by their legislatives. And this, I do hope, is the big wake-up call the industry needed, that especially for transaction monitoring, not only do we need to get it right, but we need a system that works and that is suitable across all of our products, all of our services and our business model, which currently is not the case. And um, so obviously then on an ethical AI perspective, and again, I know, look, this is something you talk quite a lot about. There is a concern around, you know, there, unfortunately, everybody has a subconscious bias. And when you're teaching a system or explaining stuff to the system, how can you stop the subconscious bias coming through in that education? And obviously, how can we also ensure that when we're teaching systems that we're teaching them in an ethical way? Um, and how do we test that also? Yeah, so when it comes to, uh, once again, application of machine learning, um, there are also a lot of risks. It's not easy. For example, we talked about transparency of the algorithm, of the outcome, explainability, auditability, right? Um, and also, you know, the accountability of the output generated by machine learning, who's responsible for it, who's accountable for it. And uh, uh, one of the things that are becoming more and more relevant today is, uh, you know, if you, 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 you read it on the paper, that some machine learning algorithm had made in the past decision, which were uh, uh, biased which were um, making assumptions based on uh, data points that should have never been used. For example, they, um, if you look at, um, there was a credit card that made a decision on credit risk based on the gender of the person that required the, the, the credit. And if you consider the gender or you know, the ethnicity or the location of the person, all of this information should never be used by machine learning because it generates an outcome which is biased. Some could have could argue yeah, that the outcome is, uh, um, works for a specific context, but as a society, we have a moral responsibility to make sure we use the right tools to make the right decision, and we also audit and uh, uh, control the outcome of the tools. So explainability is important, but making sure the information is given to the machine is the right one, and therefore the out we minimize the bias or the outcome and we put in place a governance whereby there is an you know a, a, an independent body that assess if our bias is present and uh, uh and, and if there are any any problems uh, any problems at all 
there was a, a question in, in the chat and um, I'm not necessarily sure is, um, is related to ethics, but I think it's quite, it's quite important. Lidner was asking about, um, let's see if I can find the question. You know, um, there is how many, uh, you know, uh, there was an article 10 to 15% of the transaction process by rule-based systems, um, um, only 10 to 15% are um, um, basically, uh, there is an alert against in terms of money laundering. I would say even more than that, 99% of the money laundered goes through the system. So the effectiveness of traditional rule-based system is less than 1%. Yeah. So there is definitely a, a case for the application, for the announcement of uh, anti-money laundering, for, for making better use of uh, machine learning, multiple use cases to basically increase the amount of, you know, or the percentage of money laundering that we detect. Yeah. And, yeah. and here there is a slide and, you know, apologies, we only get a few minutes. There are multiple applications we can use uh, machine learning to find unknown unknowns. We can use machine learning to improve the efficiency of what we know of the patterns that are known, minimizing false positives. And we combine, can combine all of this with traditional rule-based system. So my, you know, if there is one takeaway from me today that I would like you guys to, to take with you is that there isn't just that you know, I use machine learning or I don't use it. There are multiple use cases that help the analysts throughout their journey to make you know their life better, more efficient, and focus on the where the risk is. Yeah, and and it's statistically, it's quite a, quite a good point there as well. We hear various statistics thrown around, um, and one of the statistics that I've heard a few times is, our existing systems enable us to identify eight percent of the risk in our book. Two percent of that is actually a positive hit. The other six percent is something we find in the client profile that was unrelated to the alert when we were looking at the alert um, and so that's actually a really frightening statistic and um, you, you know you look as you said the success rate is less less than one percent um, I, I've heard the statistic two percent so you know putting them together our current traditional systems have a one to two percent success rate and the amount of money that we're putting into the back end to review a number of false positives are coming out of this, this, these systems. It's absolutely shocking. And I know, I know, I know, Arun, that this is something that you've worked on numerous times over the years in kind of, you know, backlogs, transaction monitoring, risk, you know, putting them into from a risk perspective, reprioritization of alerts. And I suppose the biggest lesson learned is the fact that the systems themselves aren't doing what we need them to do, because what is the SAR translation rate that we're really seeing? Yeah, that, that's right, uh, Unag, and, and maybe I'll, I'll slightly uh, touch on the topic that many a times people think that, uh, you know, transaction monitoring is the only uh, leg or the only pillar which is taking care of the money laundering risk. Uh, but seldom do people understand that, you know, that equally every pillar of the customer life cycle, which is be it the customer onboarding, be it the transaction monitoring or even uh, the, the customer or transaction level screening, which is basically the uh, screening against the watch list. And also the ultimately the alert adjudication process. Each, each of these are, are eventually you know, taking care of the, the AML risk uh, uh, overall. Uh, so if, if, if we have not done our, our uh, required bit on, on knowing our customer properly, we should not really blame on, on the transaction monitoring systems or the AI to really take care of, of that. And, and that, is, uh, that is something which the front line uh, who are dealing with the customers have a responsibility to, to know and to escalate uh, the things better. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I put this in this particular slide, and I, I don't want to go into too much of detail because we have covered this in some, some form or the other is, is around how the journey around the past, present, and future is is moving. Uh, uh, many of the banks the, the, or, or the financial institution, depending upon you know the size and all, uh, their their current situation may still be in what I'm showing it over here as past. Uh, but uh, you know there are the organizations which have made quite a bit of headway. You know either uh, through their own learnings or maybe due to a pressure from uh, uh, from the uh, the the prosecutors that we had to uh, move ahead uh, and cross over from the present and coming on to the future uh, here. Uh, I briefly covered around the the natural uh, language processing and and the cloud uh, based uh, utilities. Uh, 
uh, one another thing that I would want to emphasize here is around the dynamic uh, segmentation. This is this is a very very key important part. Even if we are not on on AI, but even if we do enough justice on the dynamic segmentation on our on our existing TM systems, that that itself is going to be a big achievement because the more that we know our customers. It is we should not really wait for the customer life cycle or you know a, a periodic review of the customer to change the customer segment. It it is something which has to happen on an ongoing basis based on what we uh, look at the customer transaction behavior. Absolutely, and I have to say we get so many questions here coming in in the chat room. Apologies for all of the questions that we haven't touched on today. Um, one of the earlier questions we had that near near the beginning. Um, was with regards to you know given the fact that we're using it was from john john magra who basically said we're investing a lot of money in ai to identify financial crime but what's the likelihood of criminals also using ai well 100 percent, they will be you know the best money launderers out there are at least two steps ahead of us in terms of you know, we, we are unfortunately in a situation currently where we're reactive to risk. A risk and typologies emerge and then we update our systems to, cap, to basically capture those types of profiles, those types of risks. What we're hoping that AI technology will begin to do is to front run and foresee those risks before they begin to emerge. We'll actually identify and be able to, to second guess that this is potentially a way a criminal will be moving. And, and look, that's something for me that's incredibly exciting about this because, you know, to, to be able to be in a proactive as opposed to reactive situation, which is unfortunately today we are reactive. Do many clients talk to you about this um, in terms of what machine learning can do to potentially identify these typologies in, in a proactive manner? Yes, so one of the key use cases for machine learning is what is called adaptive profiling. So you've got the machine learning from a customer behavior or a segment behavior or a population behavior and trying to identify unexpected behavior in a population without knowing anything upfront. So this is basically the use case for what is called unsupervised learning, which was one of the first use cases for machine learning, is the ability to have an independent set of lenses and uh, tools that can sift through billions of transactions and detect the most unusual patterns. So this is definitely something that is really important and the proactivity is basically provided by this machine learning, which is completely independent from rules that have to be pre-configured that basically can augment the information provided by rules, highlighting just the most unusual behaviors compared to the behaviors that the rules have been pre-configured to, to identify. Yeah, and I have to say on, on the slide we have now, we, we did a polling on where uh, members of today's uh, webinar would actually put the maturity of their technology. I have to say, I was surprised if anybody put it anywhere beyond um, DevSecOps, which I think was actually a big ask. I, I do think as an industry, and which is frightening in the year 2020, that we're somewhere between ops and develop ops. You know, we haven't got, we're, we're still in some instances, some banks are running in legacy systems that are 25 years old. You know, our technology, unfortunately, is something that we keep adding on top but we don't strip it back and kind of think, right, we need to get this right and we need to start again. So, you know, we, especially with the implementation of AI technology and machine learning, there are going to be many instances now where we just have to take a step back and stop trying to put a plaster, um, a plastering over a crack in a wall, so to speak, and just re-strip back the system back to basics and, and re-implement it um, with an effective futuristic solution. Um, so thank you for everybody for being honest on, 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 on that slide. So, so look at, you know, kind of as we're coming to, we've just come on to the hour now, you know, areas for improvement. How can we get this right going forward? Um, could you possibly maybe share some of your thoughts with us? Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, I know we've been talking about natural language processing. And one of the areas where there is a lot of research and analysis at the moment is uh, that. Now, if you look at, there are some models, for example, GPT-3, but all of these models have learned a lot by analyzing billions of sentences and data points. So the idea is 
ways to apply uh, NLP models to augment uh, transactionalized structure, structure data. Um, so this is one of the areas that's really important, the ability to make sure we combine all of the data from your screening uh, process, your monitoring process, your review process, all of this information within a single view of the customer um, in dynamically assessed, that's definitely where we are focusing a lot of effort on. And, uh, and once again, combining all of these use cases, we, 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 believe, we looked at the, the use cases for machine learning just in these in this areas so where there are more than 30 different use cases. And one of the key things that in my opinion is really, really important is data sharing. So imagine uh, a future where uh, banks can share their suspicious patterns between um, amongst each other and uh, and therefore do something which um, is happening with, with fraud but not we're not quite there when it comes to anti-money laundering it's the ability to share patterns to be able to work together to minimize or to reduce the uh, money laundering and finally in my opinion is you know uh, the ability to combine all different types of data together, structure and structure, text, email, uh, profiles and so on, to assess the client in a you know, 360 um, de degrees, but you know, rounded view of the clients, that, that is where I think the future, the future uh, um, uh, will be. The ability to see, analyze, alert on client behavior using multiple data points and multiple information as opposed to just having maybe transaction monitoring, transaction screening, all separated and siloed and not talking to each other. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that look. And, and Arun, again, from your perspective, you know, being there and in the weeds of the day-to-day -day challenges and getting this right um, and the future problem, I think one of the things that we're incredibly mindful of is let's not run before we can walk. And, you know, I remember once, maybe slightly separately, but trying to develop, a, um, you know, management information for a large, a large global bank. And the challenge is if you try, you know, once you start to do that, you realize that there are different systems operating in different jurisdictions, which have different ways of, of recording information. And, you know, if we want to, as Lucas said, we do need to have a single customer view. Uh, that is where we ultimately need to get to. But I think um, Arun, from experience, um, and especially from my, from my side from being in the industry and, and potentially from your side as well, we shouldn't run before we should walk and we should maybe start small and then build out. Yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, Unagan. I, the only point that I would uh, uh, you know, want to add to you know, all, all these people who are there on this call is to be open, you know, to, be, to remain open to the idea that yes, you know, there is a different world which we can get into, it is it is a journey that we all have to embark. Uh, but the moment you are open, you will be in a position to better explain uh, to your stakeholders. You know, senior management who would always cost conscious, regulators who want uh, us to be uh, in a better position to manage the risk. So, in the moment you, we understand and acknowledge that yes, this is the future world to to prevent the criminals using our uh, organizations uh, to, to launder funds. That is how we will be able to uh, uh, articulate the importance of this to our stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, hopefully, you know, and I, I shouldn't say hopefully because um, he's an incredibly nice person, but what's happened now with the, with the previous CEO of ING and now being personally held liable will send a warning shot across the industry to other CEOs who will now sit up and say, right, what do we need to do to future proof the business and really identify the risks in our book? So we've had an amazing amount of questions today. It's incredible. Um, all the questions have been coming in. So thank you to everybody. I think it's really clear that we need to make sure that we have a regulatory government agency and intertwined industry perspective we need public private partnerships to make this work we need the support of the regulators um, as luca pointed out you know AI, ai is not the cost it used to be and i think that's one thing that puts a lot of people off and i think you also need to consider the cost today and the long-term advantage as opposed to having a quick fix today which is going to break or indeed put you into regulatory challenges or breaches in a, in a, in a couple of months or a couple of years from now. So on that note, um, Luca and Arun, I'll pass it over to you to say some, some final thoughts, if I may. So, so Luca, first to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, it was really good for me to, to be here today and uh, lots of very interesting questions. I know there are maybe another 10 
10, 15 questions that um, we weren't able to answer today because of the time. But um, if you have any you know, questions or you want to have a chat or talk or anything politically correct and politically incorrect, just throw me an email. Um, I'm happy to have, I always have an opinion. And uh, you know, it's a very fascinating subject, but it's also very complex and it's very, you know, it's evolving on almost on a daily basis with models and technology being published uh, every month. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, but it's also uh, not, not easy to, to, to understand what's, what's happening in, in the industry. So just drop me a line, give me a call. And you know, if you have any questions, we can, we can talk about it. Thank you, Luca. And, um, and you over, over to yourself, Arun. Yeah, Unag, uh, you know, uh, you and I had, had the experience of, you know, facing the problems when things go wrong, uh, you know, when, when uh, the regulators and prosecutors basically feel that whatever that you had been doing was, was completely wrong. And the entire effort of trying to make it right is, is, a, is a huge amount of effort. So, you know, it, my only message would be, you know, we, we should not be taking these things lightly. The, 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 this is... Uh, AI is not an option that you can live away with. This is, this is a future world which you have to embrace uh, either now or maybe just in a couple of years or so. So uh, I'm, I'm right now taking a break from work. So therefore, uh, if, if any one of you just want to reach out to me of you know, my, my experience of how we had dealt with the deferred prosecution agreement, et cetera, you know, happy to be involved in any formal or informal. Wonderful. And I hope, I hope, like Luca, politically and unpolitically correct questions, you don't mind which come your way. <laughs> um, and on that note as well, um, as always, um, from a raw compliance perspective, we're always here. Any questions, if anybody has any ideas for future webinars, just let us know. You know, our goal is to help share knowledge and experience across the industry to drive innovation and hopefully to then promote a better compliance culture. So I want to say a big thank you once again to Luca and Arun for your invaluable time today. This has been an amazing webinar. The questions speak for themselves, how you engage the audience has been. Also a massive thank you to all of our attendees today. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. So thank you so much for your participation and your interest and your questions. Um, and also a big thank you, I should always say to my colleague Jay, who's the person that's behind all of this, kind of getting it all up and running. So thank you to everybody. Um, if I don't see you in the next webinar before Christmas, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year in advance. Um, and may 2021 be a better year than this one has been in many regards. But from a raw compliance perspective, it's been an amazing year. So thank Thank you to everybody. Thank you for your time today and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.